Is formula worse than breastfeeding? And does sleep training somehow harm my child? And what if I decide to put my child in childcare? Is that like destroying their relationship with me? And what about this whole screen time thing? Is that wrecking their brains? There are so many questions that I get about how different parenting practices affect parent-child relationships. And I get it. Raising a tiny human when you have very little instruction and no user's manual is terrifying. And even if you did have a user's manual, there's really no guarantee that what works for most kids will work for your kid because every kid and every parent is different. And there are a ton of different parenting approaches and styles and philosophies to pick from. And our parenting styles are affected by how we were parented, how our peers parent, how we think we should parent, and other cultural and historical considerations as well. And I see how it can quickly become this like self-doubt spiral of, of this panoply of choices all fraught with this judgment and shame from other people who frankly just choose a different philosophy. Do you have to breastfeed or is formula okay? And am I a terrible parent if I let my child watch their iPad movie for a little while while I make dinner? And if I sleep train my infant, does that make me a terrible neglectful parent? Okay, stop, everybody take a breath. One of the most distressing things I hear from parents is that they feel like they're being constantly judged by other parents or peers or society in general about how they're choosing to parent their children. Now we have learned some foundational things about caring for young children from the last several decades of scientific research. First and foremost, it is important, nay, essential for new parents to care for their infants' basic needs regularly and responsibly. We know that when parents consistently respond to their baby's cries or other bids for attention and subsequently help them calm down or address their needs, that these babies then learn that adults can be relied on for support and help. So here's where I ask you, are your child's basic needs being met consistently? Do they know that they are loved? And do they know that they can rely on you or other adults for help when they need it? If the answer to those questions is mostly yes, then you're probably on the right track. Because it's not so much what we do as how we do it. And if you've got consistency and love and comfort at the core of what you're doing, then the specific strategies that you use to parent are frankly less important. So now that we've effectively kicked some of that guilt and shame stuff to the curb, let's talk about some of the questions that I often get about different kinds of parenting practices. Do mothers and babies need skin-to-skin -skin contact after birth in order to develop a secure attachment relationship? Prior to about the 1980s or so, common practices in the US at least involved mother-infant separations immediately after birth. And skin-to-skin -skin contact, especially in the first few hours of life, were actually pretty rare. But did that put infants who were born prior to 1980 at considerable risk for not developing secure attachments with their parents? No. Although early skin-to-skin -skin contact is highly beneficial and is now recommended, it's only one factor that contributes to how a parent bonds with their infant and isn't the only thing that determines whether that attachment relationship is secure. Does going with formula over breastfeeding affect attachment? How we feed our babies is an emotionally charged question for many parents and has varied a lot over historical times and across cultures. For the first six months of life, the American Academy of Pediatrics actually recommends exclusive breastfeeding. For six months to 12 months, they recommend continuing breastfeeding along with solid food. However, breastfeeding is not always possible or desirable for all mothers. Research also shows us, in the United States at least, many mothers who would like to be breastfeeding don't always meet their breastfeeding goals, largely due to societal barriers like shortened or non-existent maternity leave. But although breastfeeding has many amazing health benefits, both for infants and for parents, it's not required for the infant to develop a secure attachment relationship with their parent. Formula is the best available alternative to breast milk, and formula feeding can also offer the same kind of closeness and contact and connection for infants as breastfeeding. And if the act of breastfeeding were necessary to form secure attachment relationships between parents and their children, then babies would never form secure attachment relationships with their fathers, which they overwhelmingly do. Is sleep training harmful to attachment? Not surprisingly, much like breastfeeding, where and how infants engage in sleep has varied across cultures and historical times. Especially early in life, infant sleep cycles are <laughs> very different than adult sleep cycles. Babies are awake a lot. Mm. Those frequent night wakings and ensuing sleep deprivation can be really hard on parents. And so some parents choose to use sleep training techniques, like letting infants cry for a certain amount of time to settle to sleep. 
Like a lot of parenting philosophies, sleep training methods haven't been extensively scientifically studied. And sometimes rigid adherence to a particular sleep training method, such as letting infants cry it out for a certain period of time, can be both really stressful to the parents and to the infants. However, excessive sleep deprivation on the part of the parents also contributes to stress and may cause more difficulties for parents and children. Now, the American Academy of Pediatrics provides some helpful tips on helping infants sleep. Links are in the description, as well as some information about sleep development in general. For older infants and toddlers, remaining sensitive while also setting limits can promote healthy sleep and healthy relationships. Will putting my child in childcare hurt their attachment relationship with me? Research has not conclusively determined how much time a child needs to spend with someone in order to develop a secure attachment relationship. However, we do know that the quality of time seems to be more important than the quantity of time. In addition, we know that children who form secure attachments with people at home are more likely to have secure attachment relationships with others in their lives. That said, the transition to a busy childcare environment when a child is used to a much quieter home life situation might be stressful for them. So you should expect some ups and downs when introducing a child to a new environment. Furthermore, you wanna be sure you're selecting a care environment that provides consistent and responsive caregiving and similar values to your own. Many states have quality care rating programs and licensing for childcare environments, so be sure to do a little bit of research ahead of time to select a place that will provide the best care suited for your family. Can screen time affect attachment relationships? Well-designed media can provide opportunities for learning and for creative play, but screens often compete for both parents' and children's attention. And children under the age of two tend to lack some of the important cognitive development skills that are needed to really learn from digital media. The American Academy of Pediatrics emphasizes that for children under two years of age, that screens are not a substitute for interaction with caregivers. And screen time can easily take away from the important time that parents and children spend together doing relationship building activities like reading a book or playing on the playground or cooking dinner. Research also shows us that when parents are heavy media users by having a TV on in the background or checking their phone a lot, that it actually distracts them and disrupts the interactions needed to build healthy attachment relationships. However, if you need to have your child watch an age appropriate program while you're taking a quick shower, it's not gonna destroy their brains. Again, the American Academy of Pediatrics provides some great evidence-based recommendations for parents in setting screen time limits and in healthy media practices for the whole family. And when young children do use media, try to use it as a relationship building tool and not just a distraction. For example, you might video chat with family members who live far away or talk about how the characters in their favorite TV program are feeling. Or maybe you'll look up the favorite animal that you just saw at the zoo and learn some fun facts about them. Screens, like most forms of media before them, aren't inherently good or evil. It's all in how we use them. So these are some of the common questions I run into when I talk about building secure attachment relationships between parents and their children and how different parenting philosophies might affect that. But I'm sure I didn't cover all of them. So if you have other questions about attachment development and how parenting practices might influence that, put them down below in comments and I'll get to as many as I can. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. And if you wanna share it with somebody else who might be freaking out about screen time or breastfeeding, feel free. I wanna give a special shout out to Dr. Amanda Hodell who helped me with the research and writing of this video. You're the best. And as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.